Senna, the movie, amazing. Is that the topic today on the Royal Testament? No, the topic is McLaren, the manufacturer, McLaren, the company. Why? It's fascinating. Jeff, last episode remote, I promise. Today, I, Alex Roy, Jeff Musial, talk McLaren on the Royal Testament. Can't, I can't believe you're doing this to me again. I cannot believe you're doing Enough. this to me McLaren's again. Enough. McLaren's awesome. Let's just get started. Okay. Senna, the movie, amazing, but we're not talking about Senna. We're talking about McLaren. Why? When I saw Senna, the movie, last week for the first time, I was absolutely fascinated by the relationship between Senna and Ron Dennis. And I thought I knew a bit about McLaren and the racing team, and I knew a little bit about their road cars, like the MP412C and, and the F1. But after some reading, I, I, was, I could not believe how unique and interesting the company is. Can you think of one other company that came out of racing and builds road cars? Oh, it's Ferrari. Come on. Ferrari. Ferrari. But unlike Ferrari, which built, which for whom, which they're known for, by most people as a road car builder, McLaren is still very much a racing company. And, in fact, they've now diversified to several companies. Jeff, let's talk about that. Well, yeah, you've got three companies with the McLaren, um, two of which people don't really recognize uh, until recently. Um, first and foremost, you've got McLaren Electronics. Uh, people don't know this, but every every Formula One car in the uh, the paddock this year and for the past few years has had McLaren Electronics in the car. So you look at Lotus, you look at Ferrari. There's McLaren Electronics in there. Not only that, starting next year, NASCAR. Every single NASCAR will have McLaren Electronics in it. Interesting. Um, it's very interesting, uh, and that uh, McLaren Electronics with McLaren Racing kind of. Um, also involves McLaren Automotive, which is the production Let me just stop you right there for one base. second. There happens, I used to be a hi-fi salesman in college. There happens also to be a McLaren-branded uh, portable radio, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> Keep going, JF. Well, you, you have uh, McLaren Automotive, which is uh, most recognized for the McLaren F1. The, one of the, it was, at one point, the fastest supercar out there, uh, three-seater using, um, you know, uh, using exotic metals and, and carbon fiber technology that was unheard of at the time. And now you've got the MP4 uh, MB, MP4 slash 12C. I think that's the most confusing name ever. It makes I, sense, I, but if it's, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but they are not remembered for the McLaren... Uh, cooperation with Ford in 1980, where there was a McLaren Mustang, which we should not talk about. But that's for another time. Keep going, Jeff. <laughs> another time. So you've got the MP4-12C, uh, um, which is a road-going road mid-engine V8 twin-turbo um, supercar that goes for about $230,000 here in the U.S. Um, but what people don't recognize uh, is that that technology from racing has spawned this car, much like the F1. Now, over the past couple of months, uh, actually in the past month, there have been a, a slew of reviews of the MP4-12C, and they have been too good. Um, well, Evo uh, Magazine, I, if, if I may say something, because you yeah. know that I used to be the Rambler, I think we traded places. Two things about the car, uh, I attended uh, a preview kind of uh, cocktail party um, with my old friend Michael Ross, um, you know, sometime last year before it came out, and at, at that initial preview, there was some grumbling by potential customers that the styling was not progressive or edgy enough. And, or you know, yeah. and that's, that's, there's no question there compared to the F1 styling. And yes. uh, the second thing, and I, I know what you're, you're gonna, about to say, which is that the performance, however great, is not quite equivalent to a Ferrari 458, which is considered the, the, the competition. Every magazine out there has uh, pretty much chosen the 458 up against the MP4-12C. Now, I have to admit, um, we haven't driven either car, so I can't say that uh, one is better than the other, but from what I've read, um, the 458 won hands down. And I know there's some debate whether or not the Ferrari press car that was always put <laughs> up against the MP4-12C was kind of boosted, but um, well, I think McLaren it's pretty. I mean, admit, I think it's pretty clear. I mean... It, McLaren is not the only manufacturer to come out and say that the Ferrari test cars are boosted. Yes, that's true, and 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 I'm sure Chris Harris could tell you a lot more about that. Um, look at his Jalop his Jalopnik article. That said, uh, something very interesting happened. I read an article in Evo magazine where. Um, one of the editors wrote a letter to McLaren and told them, look, we're sorry, uh, but the car wasn't what we were expecting. Here are some things you should change. And guess what? Eight days after that letter, McLaren invited Evo Magazine back to the headquarters to drive a new prototype. 
And what did they find out? Well, McLaren listened to what everyone was saying in the reviews, and I think that's what we really need to talk about today. The fact that McLaren is learning from the reviews and learning from customers to make a car that isn't really done yet better. They listened well, to the feedback, the fact if that I'm, it if wasn't... If I'm correct, didn't they turn the car around in like a week or two? Yeah, it was, it was eight days they turned a, a new prototype around that that addressed all the issues that people were saying about the, the initial press cars. You um, know, things like the gear, the gear shifts weren't correct, especially with the paddles being too harsh, the exhaust, um, just simple things that uh, they changed very progressively to make the car better and they're still working on it. And I think that's a very important, uh, very, very important fact to see that McLaren is listening to these reviews and before any customer gets their hand on the car, they're improving the car. Now, are they going to uh, retrofit or, or, I guess, go back to the cars that have been delivered and make those changes? Well, no, that's the thing. No cars have actually been delivered at this really? point. They, had, they have built customer cars, and they're going back and retrofitting those cars. The only cars that are really out in the hands of people right now are the press cars around the world. And those cars, they're going to be modifying, which is, says a lot for a company. They're investing a lot to make sure this car is perfect for the market. Well, McLaren, I mean, I'm not going to say that I expected this, but they almost have to do this because, I mean, yeah. the, they, they make very few road cars. The last one they made was the F1. And you know, yeah. they anything they come out with needs to be a Halo product. You know, let's assume for a second the performance is identical to a 458. The McLaren still has something the 458 doesn't, which is that it's a McLaren. And brand-wise yeah. is almost priceless. Even though the F1 has been surpassed in some ways, it's a McLaren F1. And, you know, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure the McLaren, having had some experience building road cars in conjunction with Mercedes, such as the SLR, I, I think they, they must have realized that, uh, but by the way, SLR sales were below expectations in the in the final year of um, production. Well, that, that's real true with everything, but the, they and and they got around that by just making weird versions like the Sterling Moss edition, same basic chassis, just modifying it. What I'm getting at is that it's very obvious that McLaren knows the value of their brand, and yes. you know, and and McLaren Automotive very much, uh, you know, is going to be making road cars that take advantage of that. And they, so, if the 458 is the car it's compared against, theirs needs to be at least as good, plus the brand. And yep. if you're building a money no object car, that's easy. But if you're going to attack lower market segments, like there's a baby McLaren that's allegedly going to come out uh, you know, next in yep. four years. And a, and a, convert, and a convertible, and they, they've already released the GT3 car for the FIA series. These, need to, be, with... these need to be killer cars. And McLaren is one of those manufacturers, I'm not dissing Ferrari, even though I have them in, in the past, that every car that they release must be perfect for the price point. Uh, and I don't think you're going to see McLaren build cars like Ferrari. They're not going to, McLaren's never going to come out with the equivalent of, of a California. They, they're just not or going a, to do that. Or a 16M, a car that makes no sense. <laughs> well, if you want to talk about Ferraris, there's a lot of Ferraris that are uh, best forgotten know, that they I want know, to bury. Uh, I'm curious, though, and I, I can't believe I haven't read anything about this. When they retuned that uh, MP412C, did they bring in their F1 drivers to help? Uh, I, I don't think if I don't think that's necessarily true. I think the F1 drivers may may have had Jensen and, and uh, Lewis may have had some influence from what I've read, but it was mostly their their road going engineers that did all the work. But you know, I, I think the the key point here is that McLaren is working with their with the press and working with people who have driven the car to make sure it's perfect before it goes to the customers. Very rarely do car companies turn back and say, "Oh no, it's fine." Um, you don't know what you're talking about, and, and ignore some of the general stat books. Well, look, we're coming up on uh, on eight minutes. We need to cut this short here. I just want to back out we're for not. a second to talk about Ron Dennis, because what's interesting about Ron Dennis is that here's a guy who, he, he wasn't a wealthy guy who walked into McLaren in 1980 and took it over. This is a guy who came in at age 18 and began working in Formula One. And for everyone who ever asked how to get into Formula One, this guy grew up in Woking, and yeah. at, which is where McLaren is based and devoted his yeah. life to this. And he has a unique ability to identify young talent. And if you think about how difficult it must have been in the heyday of Formula One to hire Ayrton Senna and manage Senna and Prost at the same time, I think the progressive vision you've seen across McLaren in every aspect of the company over the years is very much uh, because of Ron Dennis himself. And if you ever heard yeah. uh, him speak, he's an extraordinarily... Uh, uh, was a lucid and precise conversationalist, and you know I've never been a specific fan of McLaren, the racing team. But after researching this episode, I have to say, 
I will pay more attention to what McLaren does in every facet because he's a fascinating man. And anything that he touches, even if it doesn't work, is interesting. Well, that's it. That's all the time we have today, Alex. You better be back next week. I'm going to be back next week, no doubt. And um, we have some interesting topics. I'm not going to say the manufacturer starts with a G. I'm not going to mention <laughs> that manufacturer. But we have something very interesting coming down the pike. <laughs> Alex, talk to you later. Take care, man. I'm living in a